it's time for the Fire Girl Podcast. Meow. Jay and Gwen here as always. We have Guy on Fire in the house tonight to tell us how he acquired a mini real estate empire in the D.C. area. And it's just a few years shy of F.I. He's also my personal real estate guru whenever I have a problem in my blossoming real estate business. Let's get jiggy with it. Welcome to Fire Drill Podcast, where side hustles, savings, and creativity lead to financial independence. With your hosts, Gwen from Fiery Millennials and Jay from Millennial Boss. Welcome, everybody, to today's episode. I am at Pieces Punch. I have my partner in crime, Jay, in the studio with me today. How's it going? Hey. And uh, today's guest is a very special and... Um, uh, hard hard to uh, snag guest, but we pinned him down and got him in the studio for everybody's listening pleasure. So uh, I'd like to welcome Drew from Guy on Fire. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on the show. You're welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome. So tell us a bit about yourself. How did you, uh, how did you get into this whole fire thing? Um, how has it been going for you? What, uh, what have you been working towards? Like, tell us a bit about... Basically, just answer all of our yourself. questions in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, you know, um uh, I uh, started working back in uh, 2013 and I didn't know about fire. Uh, had big aspira- aspirations to live a baller lifestyle, you know, figure I'd have the fancy car, the big house, the country club membership that I'd never use. But, you know, somewhere along the lines I stumbled across some of the fire blogs out there and uh, realized, you know, I don't really like all the fancy toys and I don't need the expensive cars. In fact, I drive a car now that's about 20 years old, and I'm quite happy with it. Um, And, you know, I've always been fairly frugal, and I started saving at an early age. And um, I believe Mr. Money Mustache was one of the first blogs I stumbled upon. And, you know, the idea of um, retiring in my 30s sounded very appealing. And I've always been interested in traveling, and I love the outdoors. And I quickly realized working a corporate job, uh, those two things don't happen as often as I'd like. Yeah, I used to work in an office building that didn't have any windows, so it could literally be hurricaning outside, and I would have had no idea until it was time to go. Wow, that's that really is one of the most depressing things ever. Yeah, that's really sad. Yeah, it so was you, if you didn't pursue an office job, what do you actually do? So I do work in an office, but I also spend a lot of my time uh, working as a property manager, and I manage a couple dozen properties in the D.C. area. So I spend a lot of my time um, outside the office investing in real estate, managing my properties, and I manage a handful of properties for other people. Okay, because I was going to ask, how many of those properties were ones that you own, and how many of them were ones that you're just managing for other people? Yeah, definitely. So I currently own three properties. I started off with my first property, and it was really more of a house hack. I wanted to keep my cost of living low. And I ended up saving up a down payment and buying a house with three and a half percent down. And I had two friends move into the house with me and I charged them below market rents and they subsidized a large chunk of my mortgage, which allowed me to live for very cheaply. Uh, The D.C. area is very expensive when it comes to renting. A lot of studios and one bedroom apartments are fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. So paying a couple hundred bucks a month to own a house seemed like a great deal. How old were you when you um, first did that? Yeah, so I bought my uh, first house when I was 24. So that's like, yeah, that's pretty baller. That's pretty baller. So what I think a lot of us out there are interested in rental properties. I know you two, that's like your thing that you're doing right now. But for those of us that haven't dived in there, how do you like get the confidence to make that first buy? Yeah, so I ended up uh, looking for a property and. I didn't really know what I was doing on the first one. I will be the first to admit that. But I found a place that had multiple bedrooms, and that was one of my criteria. I figured I could live with a couple roommates and have them subsidize most of the cost for the property. And my first um, home, it was great, a starter home. And it didn't cover all my bills. And I was reading stories about people who would actually own properties that would cash flow and provide them income every month. And I realized that's something I wanted to do. So I started looking for additional properties, and that's how I found my second property. I can say that uh, for me, a good chunk of um, having the confidence to buy a house is because I had absolutely no idea what I was doing and or getting myself into. So you're saying like naivety is the key, just jumping in. Yep. You know, the first one, no matter um, how confident or unconfident you are, 
is a learning experience and a lot of people make mistakes along the way, but you learn from those mistakes and it makes the next one better. So much learning. So with the first one, you convinced two of your friends to live with you. Did you, but you didn't charge them enough to kind of cover your, your piece of it? So I didn't uh, charge enough to cover the entire mortgage. The mortgage originally was, I think, $2,400 a month. And then I refinanced uh, down the road and that reduced the mortgage to about 1900 a month. And I was charging both my friends 750 So it seemed like a great deal for me to own a house for, um, uh, what's that, four or $500 a month. Um, but even if I charged them market rents, it wouldn't cover the entire mortgage. Um, now that I don't live in that house anymore, I collect a couple hundred dollars a month, but I wanted something that would provide better cash flow. That's fair. So, okay. So in addition to your three properties that you own, you manage other people's property. How did that help with your own property management? So I ended up actually taking on a uh, side hustle and uh, been working for a gentleman who's been investing and managing rental properties for 15 years. Learning from him was very beneficial. He helped guide me on my second uh, purchase, which was a big fixer upper. But with uh, working with him and learning from someone who has experience, I learned how to find tenants properly. I learned how to buy properties a bit better. I also learned how to deal with uh, the nightmares of all the different dramas that go on with uh, being a landlord. So you'd say having a mentor is key to your success? I would highly recommend finding a mentor or at least somebody who's willing to show you the ropes. So you're saying you should find somebody who you can call when things are hitting the fan and you're panicking and you have no idea what's going on and no no idea how to fix things? Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's good to have that person in your back pocket. As uh, somebody who has definitely called you before going, I don't know what's going on, help me. I can say that this is very, very helpful to have people <laughs> like that in your corner. Well, I'm glad that's been helpful, Gwen. And if you ever have any problems, you always know you can call. Yeah, you want to help me figure out how to get rid of a red pleather sectional couch? You can't throw it out the window? Sadly, no. <laughs> oh, put, can you put it on like that website, Free Cycle or something? Uh, I was thinking of putting it up on Craigslist for like 20 bucks and get some sucker to pay me to move it out of there, but I don't know if that's going to work or not. Yeah. I got to clean out my uh, tenant's uh, unit now that he's out of there. Got to change the locks, clean it out. He left me a lot of garbage, which is great. And did you have a security deposit to uh, nickel and dime him for uh, the mess he left behind? Nope. Uh, Well, moving forward, I'm sure that's something you'll definitely have. Yeah, this was an inherited tenant, and uh, he did not come with a security deposit. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so, always been, yes. that's always been one reservation I've had. I've never bought in a property where existing tenants have been. I've always wanted to pick my own. Yeah, I would, uh, I would go towards that direction myself in the future. I got really lucky with the one guy. He's awesome, and this guy was just awful. So 50-50, roll the dice. But there's a silver lining that... Uh, I'm still kind of back on this like mentor thing. I've heard of the website Bigger Pockets. I know you can meet people that way. Obviously, you two met through the blog. But how how do you go about meeting a mentor? Like you can't just email people and say, "Oh, you're experienced age." Definitely. So a lot of uh, areas have local real estate investing clubs or meetups, and it's a great way to go and find people that are interested in real estate or already are investing in real estate. And most people are very open when you talk with them. They love sharing information about their business. And one of the best things I recommend is going to some sort of local meetup or going to open houses where people are looking at houses that they may be trying to buy and offer to buy them a cup of coffee or lunch and just learn about their experience. So I can say that I found mentors in three different ways. Uh, One's the blog, um, you know, chatting with uh, established landlords who are blogging about the whole real estate thing. Um, Another uh, was actually a guy who I looked at renting from him back when I was looking for a place to live. And um, I ended up not renting from him because he didn't have a a good fit for a property. But I kept in touch with him and uh, called him, you know, and every time I needed a property, I referred multiple people to him. And so we just kind of have that that working relationship where I can call him and be like, hey, you know, like, like Drew said, you know, go get a cup of coffee and just talk about stuff like that. And then um, and then the local real estate thing was huge as well. OK, so the story is you bought a house, lived with your friends, decided 
that's not going to be enough. I could do more. Found a mentor, decided to get your second property, which is a fixer upper. At this time, how old are you? So I bought my second property about a year and a half after the first property. And it was definitely a fixer upper. I mean, it's a complete gut job. I had to replace all the electric, all the plumbing, all new appliances, brand new kitchen, new floors. I even built in uh, one and a half new bathrooms. So it was a lot of work, but it was about 16 months after my first purchase. And did you know already? I'm assuming you didn't know how to do the home improvement piece of it. So I actually spent about seven years of my time volunteering and working with Habitat for Unity. And I had a basic understanding of the renovation and home building process, but I utilized what's called a 203K FHA loan, which allowed me to buy the house with 3.5% down and also gave me additional funds to renovate the property, which I then had to have a general contractor. And the general contractor helped with a lot of the work, but I also put in a lot of time myself. Got it. Okay. And I'm assuming you found all these people through your mentor, who people he's worked with, or people basically word of mouth. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate enough. Uh, so my mentor, uh, who I've also worked with for the last couple of years, he also happened to be my real estate agent. So uh, he was uh, very. Uh, he did a great job guiding me through the process. He introduced me to a handful of contractors. He himself has renovated probably about a dozen properties. And he helped me oversee the project and make sure everything as smoothly as possible. Sweet. And you didn't sell your first property. That is correct. I continued to rent it. It's not the greatest rental return, but I never bought that property uh, to be a rental. And I probably will move back in there um, and pay off the mortgage once I uh, enjoy my fire life. Oh, cool. That's awesome. I've thought about that too, because I have an accidental rental property that I bought as my forever home-ish and then moved out of it reasons but I kind of keep it around because there's a lot of complicatory there but um, it doesn't really it's not like a great rental property but I like to think about maybe moving back in at some hey is it your first property yeah that was my first thing so I'm actually curious I mean I guess it's easy to get a loan nowadays sir but was that an issue getting a loan so quickly after the first one so it was a bit challenging I had to work uh, with my mortgage broker thankfully I had a very skilled uh mortgage broker that was able to work with me and had experience with the type of loan that I was looking for. Um, And I was able to also count the rental income from my previous property, um, which was very beneficial. Oh, I thought you had to be in the property for like two years or something before you count the rental incomes. That's awesome. So uh, typically it does, but uh, they were able to work with the underwriting parameters because I had signed leases and it showed up on my tax returns for uh, prior two years with the way that the calendar fell. Oh, sweet. So there is a partial rental uh, year on one of my tax returns and a full year on the other. So my question is, uh, DC is notorious for being a super expensive city. How did you save up the money for your down payments so quickly? So I was very fortunate with the first uh, down payment. My parents allowed me to live at home for a couple months after graduating. During that time, I was saving as much of my paycheck as I could and also continuing to side hustle. So I was working a couple different side hustles and was actually living on that income and uh, putting away my nine to five paycheck. What were some of those side hustles? So I had uh, three main ones at the time. The first one, I was a swim practice taxi and I was driving this kid in our neighborhood to swim practice, which required me to get up at 3.40 every morning. Oh As somebody who was a swimmer, um, my mother would have appreciated having somebody to do that for her. So did <laughs> the parents the not want to do it? Is that what it was? Yeah. So the family was uh, fairly well to do, and they were willing to pay somebody to drive their kids so they could keep their normal sleep patterns. So basically and, you were an Uber driver without the fee? Uh, without the what? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, That's cool, though. Okay, so you're doing that. What else did you do? So I was uh, driving the kid to swim practice five to six days a week. And then I also delivered moon bounces, uh, those big uh, counts, uh, castle things kids bounce around in for birthday parties and ch- uh, church picnics. So that was fun. I would do that on the weekends. And then I also did freelance photography for an appraiser. Wow. Okay. So those are three random things. I can see how 
maybe if you knew a family friend or you knew someone with a swim taxi, is that was that how you got that one, or did you actually go out and find it? So we uh, let's see, how did I come? I found that side hustle. Uh, from a neighborhood lit serve. Uh, so everyone in the uh, neighborhood signed up on a big email chain and one of the parents shopped a note out and I said, sure, I just graduated college. Um, I have nothing better to do. Why not try this out? And ended up doing that for probably about eight months until the kid was able to drive himself. Sweet. And how did you think about the moon bounce one? Uh, the moon bounce one um, I was doing actually throughout college and for the first a year or so after graduating. And you, but how did you even know that was a thing? Like, I didn't even know, I didn't even think about that. Hey, uh, Craigslist is a wonderful place to find <laughs> odd jobs. <laughs> <laughs> All right then, sweet. I know, we, so you talked about living at home and saving a bunch of money. I had a similar experience too. When I lived at home, I think my savings rate was like 95% or something. But I only lived at home for a few months and I also knew nothing about fire or any of this. I think I was just depressed to be living at home. But now I'm grateful. Yeah, it is bittersweet. You know, your roommates aren't the coolest people to hang out with your friends, but uh, they're nice people. Yeah, exactly. Okay, as somebody who has historically had a somewhat rocky relationship with my parents, um, let me just say that I am jealous that you guys could like have the option because uh, while my parents and I get along much better nowadays, it's exactly because I don't live under their roof anymore. Mm. So I'm, I'm just going to note that, that I'm incredibly jealous right there. Yeah. It's a nice privilege to be able to. Yeah. Also my first job was an hour and a half away from them. So there was actually like no way I could have lived with them. Yeah, that would have been fair. a commute every day. Yeah. That would have been awful. All right. So you had the side hustles and then you saved up for the down payment. Did you this whole time, I forget if you said this, but did you like have in your mind that you, we're trying to do this early retirement thing or, or, or was it more like you just wanted to get into real estate? Yeah. At this point I was uh, living at home after graduation because I just wanted to get on my feet. I didn't quite know what I was doing right away where I was going to be working. And then I got a job about a month after graduating school. So I wanted to save up and I wanted to save for a house and I okay. put away as much as I could. And I actually walked away from my first property uh, because the home inspection came back and it would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars to fix the problems at this house. But I was able to find a place another two months later and um, moved out, bought the place, had my roommates move in. And I want to just keep my cost of living as low as possible. But I wasn't aware of fire until probably another year later. Got it. And then did you tell your roommates you guys have to go? Or did you, they find somebody else when you when you went to the second property? So I signed them to leases, and they were staying in the property. And I actually had a friend of one of my roommates move into my room. So at that point, I moved out, and I was living in the house while I was renovating it, which uh, is not always the most pleasant thing, but it's definitely worth it. And during that time, the old house, uh, the mortgage was being covered, and I had a couple hundred dollars every month extra which was helping for the renovation okay so like i'm just in awe of the fact that you can still live in one small room i i did everything the wrong way i started out in a three-bedroom house and then i moved into a two-bedroom apartment and now i live in a studio so i went from big to small but you stayed small the entire time how how, how are you managing that so i had a gr pretty good sized room in my first house and uh, what Gwen's referring to, I actually wrote a post um, about a year ago. My room is very small. It's uh, maybe 60, 70 square feet. And I have a loft bed and uh, my desk is underneath it. But there is virtually no extra room. And, uh, you know, some days it's challenging. But um, at the same time, I'm living in my current house, which is now five bedrooms. And my roommates pay all my mortgage. And I'm able to collect an extra fifteen to $1,600 a month. I'd say that's worth the sacrifice. It definitely is. It's done wonders for uh, getting to financial independence. And uh, I've been doing this for about a year and a half in this room. And I'm definitely looking forward to more room in the future. Yeah, I, uh, I noticed that you were jealous of how much space I have, which is hilarious to me because I feel like I'm jammed cheek and jowl with all of my stuff in this place. When your studio feels like an apartment compared to my room. <laughs> So, okay. So second property, then, then you went for the third. And at this point it was about 
kind of creating that income stream every month? That is correct. So the other two properties, they're both cash flowing. The first one, not very great, but the second one uh, provided a nice paycheck every month. And during that time, I'm also not paying to live anywhere. So I eliminated my biggest expense through house hacking, which was huge for my savings rate. And yeah, because you got that DC income with not the DC major expenses. Absolutely. So I had the DC income with no living expenses plus the side hustle income. And I was able to put away almost all of that. And really, my biggest expenses were entertainment, food, and transportation. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So, um, okay, so then third rental property, but then you got into property management. And I think that's the piece that kind of appeals to me too. Now, can somebody be a property manager who doesn't actually have their own property? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's work that will always be needed. It's, uh, I'll be the first to admit it, it's thankless work. Uh, tenants are never contacting you just to say hi or for a pleasant conversation. It's always a fire drill, something's wrong, my toilet's running, the power is out. Uh, but it's a great way to learn the business, if, especially if you want to own rental property in the future. How do you go about even getting a job like that? So I found my job uh, through my real estate agent. He was looking, his portfolio grew to a size where it was becoming a lot for one person to handle. And he was looking to show somebody the ropes and mentor somebody. So you can find these types of people at your local real estate meetups or through various real estate agents. Ah, okay. So kind of through people, through connections, that type of thing. I'm assuming, I mean, it would probably be hard to get their confidence in you if you don't have any, but that could be a good option for people who aren't willing to take, purchase themselves. Definitely. And at least in this area, I always see uh, random signs around town, uh, part-time or full-time work if you're interested in learning the real estate business. Uh, again, I always see stuff on Craigslist. You could actually get a property management company. Um, in your local area, there's regional and national players, but also some mom and pop places that maybe manage a couple of dozen places. So this, this is a legit thing through a company. It's not like you, Hey, want me to manage your home for you type thing. You're like joining a a company. company. They pay you through like direct deposit type of formal thing. Uh, That is correct. I'm technically a contractor. uh, So I get 1099 every year, but, uh, it's a residual income. And I work for a company. We have a full-time staff of repair people. And we have contractors for more complicated uh, items like HVAC systems and appliance repairs. And we provide uh, snow removal, uh, the whole nine. Uh, We do leasing, uh, you name it. So on an average month, uh, how would you go about collecting the rent? And uh, on average, what kind of cash are you looking at? (laughs) Um, Well, so we manage somewhere between 55 and 60 places currently. And with DC rents, it's uh, quite a bit of money I'm picking up every month. It's uh, well into the six figures. Dang. So you and your real estate partner? Um, not my partner. I work for him technically. Your but mentor. He's also I my guess real estate the, agent. the reason I'm asking is whenever I'm hearing about these things, I always like imagine what I feel. But I'm thinking like, oh, I could totally start my own property management company, like make an LLC, buy some Google search ads for it. Because that when, when we were moving out of our house, I literally Googled property management and picked the ones that looked close to where I lived, which sounds horrendous, but we all have a moment. It's a great fee business, at least in the D.C. area, and I think most areas around the country. Uh, property managers typically get 8 to 10 percent on residential units, so it's a residual income. In most months for an individual property, there's not a lot of work that goes into it. You're typically just collecting the rent check. However, there's the occasional hiccup. Um, uh, garbage disposal might break or stop because somebody got a bottle cap stuck in there, or a toilet might be running. Uh, but there is maintenance that you have to do over time. You have to change air filters regularly. If you're in an area with snow, you have to worry about snow removal. Uh, so there is some work that goes into property management, but the dollar per hour is fairly attractive. What does it range around? Um, so it depends on the market because it's 8 to 10% of the rent. So um, in some places, your average rent would be $1,000. But if you're in a higher cost of living uh, city like San Francisco or New York or D.C., the rent's much higher. So for here, a one bedroom typically is $2,000, give or take. Uh, now, some of the properties we manage are two, three, five, seven bedrooms, and the rents are much higher. And then you get a cut on it depending on how many of those are, are your properties. 
uh, so we charge 8% for the properties that we manage. So if somebody wanted to, man, if I eventually am going to have a property manager, I'm looking at paying anywhere from like $110 a month to 150 to the property yes. manager. That is correct. And that cover, if you have a good property manager, that will mean they're dealing with all the headaches. They're dealing with the late night phone calls and the repair requests. And all you should be doing is collecting a check from them every month and maybe approving a, a small repair to every other month. This sounds horrible, but we didn't. We decided not to do the property manager. So we are the property manager. So if something goes wrong and the property's in another, we panic for a little bit and then we do Google searching and then we, it's, that but is, it works because the, the property wouldn't break even otherwise. That but is I guess very interesting. It kind of depends been, on the house. I've always been curious about buying out of state because DC real estate is so expensive, but not having boots on the ground or not being there personally, I haven't been able to get comfortable with managing from such a far distance. So how do you typically handle a repair like that? If something went wrong, like a little bit wrong. So one time the sink was clogged, we asked a friend to come over and look at it and we just paid him for that. But lately we've been trying to handle it more professionally by searching online. And often the tenant, because it's a home, they want to arrange it on their schedule. They want to work directly with the person themselves. And that's an agreement that we made up front with the, with the tenant. We told them, hey, we're out of state. If something goes wrong, we'll, we'll get someone, we'll call them to come out, but you can make arrangements to meet them on your schedule. And that's how it's worked. That's great that you have that arrangement. Uh, I think not every landlord's fortunate enough to have that, but kudos to you. Yeah, it, it worked out. I mean, who knows? We're, we have nine more months for their lease and then we'll, they renewed it once though. Which... That long-term tenant though. Mm-hmm. Yep. Not raising that rent. <laughs> yeah, that can get a bit tricky. There's something to be said for not having turnover. Sometimes it's not worth increasing your rent to 20 or $30 that you would like to, to keep the same tenant in place, to keep them happy, and not to risk a potential vacancy. Yeah, I totally agree with that in my limited experience. So you have a bunch of side hustles going on, all this stuff. Have you calculated how many years to FI you actually are? Um, it's a very loose calculation, and I am not as religious as everyone else about tracking my spending. Which is something <gasps> I know it's a cardinal sin in our uh, in our uh, little. No, cult. it's not. It's not. I think we a lot of us have that. <laughs> <laughs> so, to answer your question, I don't know how close I am. Um, something I want to do as I'm freeing up my time over the next year is get a better understanding of my spending. But I am 27 currently, and I just hit a pretty big uh, phi milestone. And congratulations! I, Congrats! Thank, thank you. Um, and I think I'm very close and have a chance to be completely financially independent before 30. Nice. Nice. So I'm going to pry into that more because we all are in the late twenties, mid twenties, whatever we are age range. How, how do you know if that's what you actually want? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, when you're younger and you say you want something and then 10 years later, you ended up doing something completely different. How are we sure that that's what we want? Are we too young to make that decision? Um, what do you What do you guys think? Too young to make the decision to be financially independent. Okay, when you phrase it that way, it sounds crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, but there's nothing. There's no such thing as a crazy question. Appreciate that. I think a lot of people who are older, um, their reaction when I tell them my plans are usually along the lines of something along like patting me on the head and going, that's nice, dear. And in their minds, they're thinking, yeah, good luck with that. You don't know anything about the world. Wait till, you know, wait till you get married, have kids, you know, life takes over, blah, 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 all these things they pop up with. And um, I, I've gotten a lot of skepticism from people who are older who are not in the FI. So I would say that there's definitely a healthy level of skepticism on whether or not, um, our portfolios, you know, are going to last until we're old enough to get social security or whatever. If we're lucky enough to get social security. If it's around by the time we're that age. But to add on to your comment, Gwen, we, when you share that with people, if you think about it, uh, there's so many different articles out there. The average American can't come up with $500 or $1,000 if there's an emergency. So when a majority of the population doesn't even have a thousand thousand dollars saved it's tough for them to relate to our situation i think um, us in the 
financially independent or the FI community, it's tough for them to understand that we're saving 30, 40, 50, 70 percent of our income when most people aren't even contributing to their 401ks. Yeah, I uh, have a vivid memory of one of my coworkers. Um, I found out the new 401k limits for the year and I was like, oh, bummer, it only went up $500. And he's like, what does it matter anyway? And I said, well, you know, I want to put more in there. And he's like, you're already maxing it out. And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, like it was just like hard for him to imagine. But again, you know, he's on the typical regular Joe Schmo path. He's got kids and, you know, college savings and stuff to save for and car payments and house payments and all that stuff. So like it would just boggle his mind that I was sad that this didn't go up higher because in his mind, the limits were so high. You know, and it just sounds like, unfortunately, he's his life currently set up to have him stuck on the hamster wheel. You get the car payment, you get the big mortgage payment, and now you're wedded to your debt and you have to go to work to support those items. And it's uh, really a part of the American society. I mean, we are a consumer-based economy and we have idolized this um, glamorous lifestyle that's portrayed in the media. Yeah. So for you, what does fire look like? <laughs> yeah. So what is it for me with fire? I absolutely love the outdoors. I love traveling. And something I realized really early on in my working career was I am stuck at a desk for 8, 10, 12 hours a day. And yes. I was exactly ill indeed. Um, and I was just not getting outside as much as I wanted to. And I very vividly remember my first year working when uh, we fell back with the t- uh, time change. And I never saw the sun because I'd get up, go to work early, and by 5, 6 o'clock, the sun was down, and I was leaving the office, and it was dark. And I love being outdoor. I love hiking. I love biking. and I love fishing. And a lot of these things are great weekend activities uh, if you're not stuck working um, or if stuck catching up on life and doing laundry and grocery shopping. And I really wanted to get back my free time. I want to be able to have the flexibility to go for a bike ride on a really nice spring or fall day and not have to worry about a memo uh, for something I don't even care about in the office. Yeah. Yeah. Would you keep your properties too? Absolutely. That's going to be a big part of my um, finance or my fire life or my income. Um, I plan on having the properties make up somewhere between two thirds and 75% of my passive income. Uh, with that, I'd also be looking to my portfolio uh, to generate the remaining balance through dividends. And I would also be using the 4% rule. Uh, but one thing I'm doing that might be a little bit unorthodox is I also plan on having three years of living expenses in cash when I step away from everything. That way I can live off that cash and allow the rest of my investments to grow on the off chance that we do have a market correction or a recession, I should have a much better chance of weathering that storm and not having to sell anything at a bad time. Sounds like you've got a plan. It's a plan. Now, uh, let's hope I can execute on it. (laughs) You're going to do it for sure. So I know you probably write about all this stuff on your site. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about that? Definitely. So my site is guyonfire.us. And I definitely write a lot about real estate. I have a monthly report called the Landlord Report that goes over my rental property portfolio. There I share my rents that I collect, my mortgage costs, and any expenses uh, that may pop up, repairs or maintenance items, and an occasional good story. Um, Anything from raccoons, termites, and bed bugs, broken sinks, all those fun items that landlords occasionally might have to deal with. Those don't sound fun or good, by the way. <laughs> they're not fun and they're not good, but they are problems that can be easily addressed. They're, uh, they're uh, small things to worry about. Exactly. The don't big sweat things that, the small stuff. Exactly, Gwen. You don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. I mean, yeah, Gwen, you have such a positive mentor. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that we like to do in this podcast is uh, ask everybody the same question at the end. So what is your wildest dream? If, any, if you could do anything in the world, what would it be? I want to take a, at least a year off and travel the globe. I have a lot of places and things I want to see and do. I'd love to go hike the AT or the Appalachian Trail. I really want to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. want to spend some time in Southeast Asia. So we live in a big world, and um, I just really want to go exploring. 
There's a lot of places that I've dreamed about seeing, whether it's on TV or just reading about it through books. And I really want to check out what there is other than our country. That's awesome. Mount Kilimanjaro would be so cool to go see. Yeah, that is pretty. That's pretty adventurous. That's amazing. Well, maybe your blog will turn into real estate and travel once you... I definitely plan on uh, sharing my travel journeys once I get there. Sweet. So if somebody wanted to uh, ask you real estate questions or uh, plan a trip with you, how could they get? Definitely. So they can send me an email, guyonfire.us at gmail.com. They can also tweet me at guy on at guy on underscore fire, or they can uh, comment on my blog. Awesome. All right. Great. Yeah, we'll be sure to link to all those in the uh, show notes. And thank you so much for coming in today and letting us pick your brain. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Go to our website, firedrillpodcast.com to continue the discussion and get the link to our private Facebook group. If you like us, leave us a review on iTunes. If you're like me, you have no idea how to do that. So in the podcast app or in iTunes, search for Fire Drill Podcast, find it, click the reviews tab and write something to make my mother proud of me. We read every single review and want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this podcast possible. 